and welcome to another episode of Small Guild's analysis of silver manipulation. Today we're going to be talking about yesterday's appeals court ruling that overruled the dismissal of the J.P. Morgan silver manipulation case that was dismissed back in June of 2016. Now before we get started, let's just go through the difference between a civil case and a case bought by a regulator. A lot of people have written to me, a lot of people have complained that in the most recent Deutsche Bank case, where they settled for what appeared to be a pittance for $60 million, and then also in this case, that there doesn't seem to be anyone going to jail or anyone paying any significant fines. Well, that's because in prior cases that we've been following, those cases have been bought by regulators and for whatever reason the regulators have not been able to prove their case or unwilling to take their cases further and therefore nothing happens. Civil cases, however, like this JP Morgan one and like the Deutsche Bank one, have the opportunity to cause significant damage on JP Morgan and the other silver manipulators. And here's why. These cases involve private plaintiffs who have their own lawyers who are suing these large banks for manipulating the silver market in violation of antitrust laws, the Sherman Act specifically. And under these acts, the antitrust laws, you can get treble damages. So whatever damages that they have caused as a result of their manipulation, if proven, the plaintiffs receive three times that amount. Now, in the Deutsche Bank case, before we get to the JP Morgan case, the $60 million that they settled for was probably an admission by Deutsche Bank that they, if we're found guilty, we're going to have to pay a tremendous amount more than that. And since the plaintiff's attorney had a lot of information on Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Bank promised they would give them even more, they figured they're probably better off selling for 60 million. A lot of people thought, well, that's just a slap on the wrist. Well, in a way, it's strategy by the plaintiff's attorney because they will take the information and the information they got from Deutsche Bank is really solid. It basically shows the traders communicating with other bullion banks like HSBC and Scotiabank, planning and executing, manipulating trades on the COMEX over a long period of time. Now, the plaintiff's attorney in the Deutsche Bank case should be able to take that evidence and use it against the remaining defendants who have not so settled. So, before we judge that Deutsche Bank got off, let's see what happens to the other defendants that are going to have to now answer to and explain the, what seems like, damning evidence that Deutsche Bank has provided against them. Okay, now let's go into the J.P. Morgan case. Yesterday, it was reported in Reuters that the case was, that the dismissal was overruled and the case has been revived, but it didn't give much detail. I went and found the, the order from the Court of Appeals, and I'm going to take you through it so you can see that how this might be more significant than just the case is back on. All right, so let's go through it. Appeals Court overrules dismissal of J.P. Morgan silver manipulation lawsuits. Appeals Court rejects lower court judge holding the plaintiffs failed to show that J.P. Morgan made uneconomic bids in attempting to rig the silver market. Also, the suits allege that J.P. Morgan was manipulating the silver price lower to take advantage of a pricing deal with a silver miner. That raises a lot of questions. The order did not address that, but the plaintiffs, they did further research in trying to get to court the Court of Appeals to dis to overrule the dismissal was complaining about that too and saying that the judge in the initial instance didn't pay much attention to that. I believe further discovery in this case, now that it's got to go back to the judge for further consideration, could win this case against J.P. Morgan. And if so, remember, it's treble damages. So whatever the damages are, you multiply them by three. Well, let's go through the analysis of this Circuit Court of Appeals ruling that basically overruled the district court judge. His name is Paul Engelmeyer. 
will be using his name. He's been involved in these cases before, and it seems he likes to dismiss these cases before they get too far. Well, the Court of Appeal stopped him in his tracks yesterday and said that he erred in dismissing these antitrust suits. And they noted that the basis of dismissing the plaintiff's claims amounted to impermissible fact-finding, we'll explain what that is, and placed too high of a bar in concluding that the plaintiffs had not adequately pled their case. So the original case with Judge Engelmeyer, he reasoned in dismissing the case that the plaintiffs did not show that J.P. Morgan made uneconomic bids because they didn't provide the details on the specific trades or the names of J.P. Morgan counterparties with whom the trades were conducted. Unlike the information that we have now in the, in the Deutsche Bank case, where you have the actual traders talking about what they're going to do. Therefore, Judge Engelmeyer concluded that the plaintiffs didn't sufficiently make their case, or didn't sufficiently plead that J.P. Morgan intended to rig the market at their counterparty's expense because the plaintiffs didn't name who these counterparties were because they didn't know them or that J.P. Morgan made uneconomic bids. The other thing that um, led Judge Engelmeyer to dismiss the case was he did not think that the plaintiffs had explained their analysis of the correlation between the silver indicative forward market trades and tracking of silver's futures sufficiently to say that this was J.P. Morgan involved in anti-competitive activity. Well, the court disagreed, Court of Appeals disagreed with both of the contentions on which the case was dismissed. Let's go through the first one. The level of detail required in the pleading, according to the Court of Appeals, was sufficient. Now, Judge Engelmeyer said it wasn't. They said the requirement that the plaintiffs present such evidence was, in the opinion of the appeals court, a level of detail not required to withstand a motion to dismiss. Just because, what, what the court is saying here, they didn't have the, the names and addresses and phone numbers and every specific trade, that doesn't mean that you can conclude there's not a case here against J.P. Morgan. The appeals court held further. A plaintiff, is, in these types of cases, at this stage of the case, only needs to allege enough facts to raise a right to relief above the speculative level and to state a claim that it's plausible on its face. Not that it's provable on its face, that, hey, we got all the information right here. No, that there's, there, there appears to be a case. So don't dismiss the case is basically what they're saying that the, the Court of Appeals is saying that the Judge Engelmeyer, he dismissed it kind of out of hand without really looking and trying to, he was trying to prove or say they don't have proof, absolute proof that J.P. Morgan was involved in manipulation. But that's not the standard according to the Court of Appeals. In dismissing the plaintiff claims, Judge Engelmeyer noted the plaintiffs did not concretely recite what those bids and asks were or allege the amounts of these artificially tight bids and offers. And as the appeals court said, but the plaintiffs did provide some information. They did specify 14 days on which J.P. Morgan allegedly submitted bids and asks that exceeded the alleged value of the Silver's Futures economic outputs. And they say, we have held willingness to forsake short-term profits to achieve an anti-competitive end is indicative of anti-competitive behavior. What do they mean by that? They're saying if, if the plaintiffs have presented evidence Maybe not the specific trades, but if they presented evidence that there were these two-week period where J.P. Morgan is submitting bids that are uneconomic, and it looks like they're losing money to do that, well, courts have held in the past that that is what monopolists do sometimes. They're willing to lose money to achieve some anti-competitive effect benefit later on. So the court is basically saying that the judge is wrong to say they have to provide more evidence in order not to have their case dismissed. Accepting all of plaintiff's alleged facts is true. The stated dates and transactions are sufficiently detailed to allege exclusionary conduct at this stage of the proceedings. What the appeals court was saying in this case in overturning the dismissal is, look, the plaintiffs gave you enough information. 
You can't just dismiss it right now. At the pleading stage, plaintiffs also need not state the identity of the J.P. Morgan counterparties or the amount of the alleged outside profits that J.P. Morgan reached. reaped. Why? Because they don't know it. They're going into trial. They have an allegation. They need to do more discovery to figure this out. They only need to raise a reasonable expectation that discovery will reveal evidence of illegality. So what they're saying is, the appeals court is saying, look, they gave you information. It looks like, and it's beyond speculative, that something is going on here. They don't have all the information to present in the case because they haven't finished their discovery. So they're saying, the appeals court, that Judge Engelmeyer erred in dismissing this case without allowing it to go further so they can do the discovery. And it says at the pleading stage, plaintiffs need not state right the identity of J.P. Morgan's counterpart, the amount of the alleged outside profits that J.P. Morgan reached. They only need to raise a reasonable expectation that discovery will reveal the evidence of the illegality. Now, the second part of the dismissal was based on impermissible fact findings. And here, the appeals court noted, fact-specific questions cannot be resolved on the pleadings. What does that mean? Well, they objected to Judge Engelmeyer's conclusion that plaintiff's failure to, failure to both to explain why S. CIFO should track silver futures spread and to concretely plead that it did so consistently was the judge engaging in impermissible fact-finding. Why? While the district court, well, Judge Engelmeyer, may well be proven correct at a later stage of this litigation that that's not the way to uh, show the silver manipulation, our precedents caution against assessing the choice of a benchmark. So the plaintiffs had picked this benchmark as evidence of their uh, manipulation, but Precedents say that you're not supposed to decide whether that benchmark is appropriate at the pleading stage. You may determine later, look, that's not how you should prove the manipulation. Now, why this is significant is because if they get more information through discovery, they don't necessarily have to rely on this theory. They can rely on actual documents or transcripts that they get showing the specifics the thing that Engelmeyer wanted in the first place. In other words, he said in the first, his first reasoning for dismissing the case was the plaintiffs didn't have the specific information. Well, they won't need this other theory if they actually have the evidence through discovery of the specific trades that were done uh, in an anti-competitive way intended to rig the markets. So basically, the appeals court is saying that these fact-specific questions cannot be resolved at the pleadings. And the judge is not in a position to do so. He basically listened to them. He said, okay, well, I don't think that's good enough. That I, I don't think that that's the way you're going to prove anything. So you don't have a case, so go away. And you don't have specifics, and you have this general theory. That's not enough. And the Court of Appeals said, no, Judge Engelmeyer, that is enough. Now, on the issue of monopoly power, Judge Engelmeyer did concede that the plaintiffs did adequately allege monopoly power by pleading direct evidence of J.P. Morgan's ability to control silver futures prices with reference to a particular market, the long, which is the long-dated silver futures contracts market. Thus, the district court did not err in concluding that the plaintiffs plausibly alleged a relevant market. So, Engelmeyer conceded that the plaintiffs against J.P. Morgan did adequately allege monopoly power. Well, then you say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> who cares about those other two things? Case closed. They're basically saying, look, J.P. Morgan has monopoly power. Well, let's get that three times the benefits. Ah, but having alleged monopoly power or even possessing it is not enough to form an actionable claim. So just some quick background on antitrust laws. In order to get that three times damages, you have to make a claim of monopolization, not the existence of a monopoly. Just having monopoly doesn't get you your damages. You don't say, I was harmed, he was a monopolist, and therefore anything he does is monopolization, and so start paying me my three times. No. A claim for monopolization on the Sherman Act requires a plaintiff to allege, one, the possession of monopoly power in the relevant market. So 
He has to have monopoly power in the relevant market that we're talking about. And he has to willful, which means intention, willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of a superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. So if a, if a monopoly gets stronger and stronger and thereby maintains its monopoly power, that could be monopolization. You can start getting your damages. However, it says as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. So if the company is just cranking out better products after better products, producing them cheaper, you're not going to win a case against the, uh, the, the monopolist because he's not really monopolizing it in a legal way. He's doing what he should be doing, and consumers benefit from that company's Similarly, if J.P. Morgan was just a legendary trader and they were making a lot of money making these trades, there's really not much you can do about it unless they're rigging the markets in a way to gain themselves some monopoly benefits. So the case right now is at an important stage because the appeals court said that the plaintiffs adequately pled. They, they did plead willful acquisition and maintenance of monopoly power to sustain an antitrust claim, okay? So no one's in disagreement there. The judge said that, the judge Engelmeyer, and the, um, the appeals court agrees with that. And the appeals court further held that the district court, though, erred in dismissing plaintiff's state and federal antitrust claims because they did not believe that they needed to provide all this additional evidence at this stage of the game. And therefore, the judgment of the district court of Judge Engelmeyer is vacated and remanded for further proceedings consistent with this order. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means the appeals court essentially reversed the dismissal of the plaintiff's case by the district court, told Judge Engelmeyer, no, you dismissed that case, but you shouldn't have done that because they have, the, they have stated a claim, so now you have to allow them to litigate that claim. And that may involve further discovery, and through that, they may change their, their approach. And also, uh, J.P. Morgan can argue whatever <laughs> they come up with. They'll have their arguments why that's not true. But the appeals court has said that the case was dismissed basically inappropriately. So now it has to go back to the appeals court, I mean, back to the district court, to Judge Engelmeyer for relitigation. That's significant because it goes back and it gives the plaintiffs a chance to try to get more evidence and present more evidence and make their case again. Initially, their case was thrown out. They said, okay, well, we don't like this theory and you don't have enough information, so go away. The, appeal, the appeals court said, no, no, they don't go away. They go back. They go back to you, Judge Engelmeyer, and, they'll, and they're going to come up with more information, and then you can tell them to go away if they don't have a case. But you dismiss the case, it appears, prematurely. So we're going to be following this case and report when a finding is reached or when the case, maybe it gets dismissed again. Now, they don't have, like the Deutsche Bank case, and they may never get the type of evidence that the Deutsche Bank plaintiff's attorney have in terms of tra chat transcripts and um, that actually show the intent to manipulate the market. A couple other things before we close down on the case. Not only did I mention above, but it wasn't part of the order that... Um, J.P. Morgan was trying to get the price down because they had to deal with a, a fixed price with a miner, which I'd love to know what that's about. But also, the plaintiffs argued that the judge ignored 14 instances where a J.P. Morgan agent pressured the employees of the Commodity Exchange or COMEX to report invalid artificial prices. Again, it wasn't mentioned in the order, but prior to the order, the plaintiffs' attorneys were complaining to the Court of Appeals about this. So... That'll probably come back into the case when they go back to Engelmeyer again. Now, something about the judge. Now, this doesn't mean anything, but Judge Engelmeyer had also dismissed another claim that alleged J.P. Morgan had abused its power in the silver futures market a while back. 
and he ruled that plaintiffs failed to show that the bank was attempting to gain further monopoly power in the market. So it appears, and there was a, there's another case pending, and I haven't found out what's happened to it, where there's another consolidated lawsuit that accuses J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Barclays, a bunch of banks, that they were engaged in anti-competitive behavior in the swap markets. So I don't know if Judge Engelmeyer has a predilection towards rejecting these cases, um, or maybe that's just how he, that's how he calls them as he sees them. But in this particular case, the J.P. Morgan case uh, that we're following, Wacker, he's got to now look more into this case, and he has to hear more arguments, and he has to review more evidence from the plaintiffs. So we'll see what happens. We've got the Deutsche Bank case. Well, Deutsche Bank is settled, but the other uh, defendants. And we've got this J.P. Morgan case to follow. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please consider making a small donation to Small Gold. Or if you're interested in buying precious metals and you've made the decision to do so, it's not an investment advice so that you buy or not buy precious metals. But if you are interested in buying them, please consider doing so through the Small Gold site because Small Gold gets a small commission. You can compare pricing and shipping on the precious metals, the gold and silver, platinum, and palladium. And you can do so through the links provided below and also on the Small Gold website. And also, please remember to subscribe to uh, smallgold.com. You can do that by going to the website, filling in your email address. You'll get updates on this case and other gold and silver updates. And also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you very much.